course, I had to change up my shirt to introduce the next speaker, who is Chris Smith from Palumi. And the folks at Palumi were cool enough to send me this shirt that has this pretty neat looking uh, platypus on it. And it says Palumi on the back. I think it's pretty fun when I wear it, uh, I get compliments on it. And I'm sure you're going to give Chris some compliments on his talk, which is going to tell us about continuous delivery and infrastructure testing and how they're perfect fit together. I'm excited to check it out. I'll see you in the chat. Hello, I'm Chris Smith. Uh, I've worked at a couple of companies you have heard about, and currently I'm at Palumi, where I spend a lot of time thinking about CICD and cloud infrastructure. And so today, I'd like us all to answer a single question. That is, is it possible to move faster and not break things? It kind of seems obvious, right? Similar to the secret to weight loss being diet and exercise. If you want to move faster and not break things, you're going to have to have more confidence in the changes that you're making to your code and to your infrastructure. However, that's a little easier said than done. So let's talk about what the problem is in, say, modern workloads that we need to address, right? Why can't we just run more tests uh, for cloud applications? Well, first, let's take a step back and look at kind of an academic view of how software testing um, has been done in the past, right? Typically, it'll be stratified across different levels with your kind of fastest, most uh, easy to write in the unit testing layers. And then as you introduce mocks or stubs, having integration tests for where software components come together. And then finally, kind of the largest, most expensive types of tests are systems tests or integration or uh, um, tests that you know cover all the functionality end to end. But there's a problem here, which is how does this apply to the cloud, right? If you're testing cloud software, there's a lot of components that say you don't control. Your application code may involve say the business logic or how a login is performed, but if you're relying on a hosted database server or some networking component so you can actually receive uh, those web requests, then it becomes a lot more tricky. And so when you want to test cloud software, there's more than just the code that say you've written, it's where that software will run, how that data is stored, and which users have access to it. And all of these are controlled and configured in some cloud provider, whether it's Azure, AWS, GCP, uh, or so on. And so, okay, great. We understand the problem. Let's just, you know, test that. Well, if you're familiar with your cloud uh, resource console, you know, it's not something that's very amenable for testing. Um, this is a screenshot from the AWS console. And if you needed to say, go in here, click around, change settings, every time you wanted to verify a fix or, or run um, some tests, you wouldn't have a great time. And so the solution that a lot of people have started moving towards is something called infrastructure as code. And this is the silver bullet that we will be using that will enable us to actually test our infrastructure. Because once we start encoding our infrastructure in actual program code, we can then inspect it and validate it. So what is this concept? Well, it's uh, infrastructure, but as code. Um, I mean, you can see how rather than needing to manually click around in uh, a resource provider console, you can just define how you want your uh, cloud resources to be configured directly in code or a configuration file. Now, sometimes, you know, in the past you may have heard of, you know, configuration as code um, as kind of a precursor to this. Um, but if you start to use actual code, like real programming languages, you can now take advantage of the benefits of using real programming languages um, and that entire ecosystem around that. So I'll go, go into some details on uh, infrastructure as code, but um, some common tools on how you can use this are Pulumi, um, AWS CDK, and the most popular infrastructure as code solution, uh, HashiCorp's Terraform. 
one of the benefits of using infrastructure as code is that you can have be uh, express your infrastructure in a much more abstract or um, expressive way, right? Rather than having just a flat list of resources and arbit seemingly arbitrary configurations, you can start to um, encode things using, say, uh, if you need to create a set of resources, use a for loop. Or if you only need to create a certain resource at certain times, if statements. Right? This all lends itself well to making your uh, cloud infrastructure easier to manage, uh, maintain, um, and set up, especially as your infrastructure requirements um, grow. So the way it all works is essentially uh, there are three steps. First, you write some code that defines, uh, that creates cloud resources, you know, say by calling a constructor or whatnot. Now, when you run that program, it'll evaluate those resources in memory and create the resource graph, and that will be a, a goal state, so to speak. And if you diff that, uh, resource state or goal state from, you know, say the last time you ran your update, you can see what changes need to be performed. And that's say a preview of your um, deployment. And then if you actually want to apply those changes, then, you know, you would update your resources. And that is then what would go and contact your um, cloud resource provider and actually go and create, um, you know, new resources or delete um, existing ones. So with this ability to encode cloud resources uh, within application code, we can now start to test it in ways that will allow us to understand and validate not only the application code that we've written, but also the uh, environments that that application will run and have more confidence that we're not gonna break production if we ever say touch some networking change. So if we're going to put this all together, um, we need kind of some sort of application that's not too complicated, but uh, not, you know, basic. And so what I'd like to do today is I'm a little excited. The worldwide launch of Countdown as a service. I'm actually thinking about quitting my job and getting some of that sweet, sweet VC money. Um, and the app uh, is simple, right? If there's ever an exciting event, that you want to um, say get a notification, super excited every day, you know, a new text message or an email, this software as a service package uh, will do that. Or um, maybe say there's a, a, an anniversary coming up and you know, you want a, a heads up a few days before, there you go. So it's still a, a work in progress, but let's talk about how we could actually test this application and um, verify that everything's on the up and up. So here's uh, its overall architecture. Uh, it's straightforward, runs a single EC2 VM on AWS, and it reads and writes data using uh, NoSQL DynamoDB. And then separately, uh, a regular CloudWatch event fire, say, every day that will then run an AWS Lambda to read from that database and then send out messages as needed, say, um, to all the, the subscribers for you know, various events. So again, the goal here isn't to be a, a super you know, fancy application, but just have enough infrastructure that we can think about how we would actually test this and um, provide, uh, have more confidence making changes. So, Let's talk about kind of, well, what's the view of unit testing in when we're looking at, the, at that through the lens of cloud resources? Well, one of the benefits of, you know, when you're using infrastructure as code, you have that ability to preview changes. That is, build the resource graph in memory of what the way things would be created or would be configured without actually needing to go and create them. And this allows us to write unit tests for the expected inputs to resources. So in this image, you'll see the DNS record for get.pulumi.com, which is uh, a service that we use at Pulumi for distributing, you know, plugins and, and binaries. And so the uh, DNS record has several inputs, such as, um, you know, 
uh, aliases or, or you know, zone IDs. And what we can do is in our code, verify that those inputs are what you would expect. So tools that you can use for doing this type of testing are Plumi and AWS's CDK. And so when you think about testing resource inputs, uh, the thing to keep in mind is that it's well suited for asserting the requirements of your infrastructure. That is the things that are very important that they, uh, you know, need to be enforced even as the application evolves. And so there are several uh, areas to look at, such as, you know, permissions and making sure that dependent services have the right um, setup and configuration to actually work, um, or that say any SLOs that your team or group is trying to um, adhere to, well that say your infrastructure supports that. And this is actually something that can be surprising um, if you think about it. You know, for example, if you want to have say two and a half nines of reliability, well that would mean that whatever uh, systems you have for monitoring or, or alerting, you know, need to have a, uh, a particular level, degree of sensitivity in order for you to not only find out about that, but then take some action like, um, you know, doing a failover or uh, sending traffic to, to a replica or whatnot. So let's look at uh, how this would actually work in practice, just as an example for this type of testing. So what I have here is the source code for the super exciting countdown as a service. Um, and you can see this is the uh, Pulumi source code for where we're creating um, these resources. In this case, however, uh, all of the resource creation is done in separate files and then we just export these properties. So if we want to run the unit tests for our infrastructure, not our application code, then all we need to run is npm run test. Because we've written, because the infrastructure is written in code, we can use the same testing tools and frameworks that other, uh, you know, real programming languages use, or in case of using uh, Java or TypeScript and JavaScript, um, Mocha. And so the tests, uh, for this application, as you can see, you know all, all the tests have passed. Um, and then here's how we write, wrote them. First, we uh, mocked out the part of the Plumi engine which actually constructed resources. So rather than say uh, comparing resource state with some previously known state, or you know contacting the cloud resource provider to make changes, we just want to keep it in memory. So this is essentially some boilerplate code to say, don't, don't do anything with those results. And then we can just launch right into writing tests. Um, this is the same sort of uh, setup you'd see for a prototypical um, you know, JavaScript test, uh, but we're getting the Plumi cloud resources that would have been created, and then checking that their inputs are as expected. So in this particular test, let's say the organization requires that all resources have some uh, particular tags, like a name or an owner, so that you know, those resources can be reclaimed later. And so we then uh, check the you know, VM's tags have those properties. Um, similarly, you know, another type of uh, test we can have is verifying that the instance size of a machine kind of is some uh, known class, right? So sadly, uh, until I can fully bootstrap my uh, new startup, um, I'm just gonna have to reside on, on T2 micro instances. Um, you know, and, and you can see how, again, this just allows you to encode the requirements of your infrastructure in code. And so, um, for example, say when it comes to the uh, DynamoDB tables, uh, the application code requires or assumes that it has the certain indexes exist on the data store. And so because of that, we can then, when we create those cloud resources, um, assert via uh, unit test that, hey, this is the, the hash key or um, sort key for that, that database. So just to quickly recap, 
Infrastructure unit tests provide a very quick way to verify changes. It doesn't require contacting the, um, you know, the cloud or, or you know, using any external APIs, um, but instead it all just runs on your local machine. The trade-off, however, is that you can only validate resource inputs. It doesn't actually uh, look at existing resources on the cloud, um, which means that you can't look at some complex sorts of setups. Okay, so we've looked at that bottommost layer of the kind of test hierarchy. Well, you know, what does integration testing look like from the view of cloud applications? And you know, looking at live resources. So. Uh, I'm going to tell you if my what my what my plan is if my you know new startup doesn't um, work out. I'm going to build a time machine, okay, and all and I'm going to build a consulting firm. And all my consulting firm is going to do is tell people which AWS S3 bucket is set for publicly uh, uh, has public read access, okay. And I'm going to tell companies you can you know give me millions and millions of dollars and I will prevent these horrible data breaches that you see all the dang time. The next thing uh, approach that we'll be using is looking at something called resource policies or um, ways that you can uh, essentially apply the same types of unit tests that we wrote before, but applying them at the time before a resource is created. So for example, preventing bad changes from ever being uh, made to the cloud or inspecting resources after they've been created and confirming that they uh, adhere to various policies or whatnot. And by doing so, we can um, not only verify that there's kind of a min bar of you know, quality or, or security across our cloud infrastructure, um, but we can also you know, make sure that the live resources that we have um, don't have you know, common sorts of problems. And so some tools that uh, you can use today to do this sort of thing are Pulumi, HashiCorp Sentinel, or uh, Open Policy Agent uh, OPA. Similar to infrastructure as code, policy as code is, well, kind of sort of the same thing. Um, allowing you to essentially take those, the types of validations that we wrote in unit tests, but applying them as a policy that can then be, um, you know, checked across every resource change that happens in an organization um, and essentially raises the min bar uh, for you know, resources within your, your company. So let's take a look at how to apply this policy as code in practice. So here we have uh, our, our uh, infrastructure code for say the countdown service. Um, you know, where does policy come into play? Well, this is perhaps a, a very boring demo, um, but if we say go to GitLab, where the uh, code for this application all res uh, resides, I'm just gonna click this link to the Pulumi stack where this exists. Um, and so this is the production instance of that application. Um, we can see all the resources and the you know, update history um, for the app. And if we click into these details, you can not only see um, the changes, but you know, policies already being checked. In fact, uh, we can drill in here and see these are uh, within Pulumi. Uh, my organization has been configured to apply, you know, the Pulumi AWS Guard policies across every stack update. And so, whenever I make changes, uh, you know, a, several, or a collection of AWS specific resource policies will be ran. And sure enough, we can see a couple of resources in my stack have some violations. And so let's drill into the backend VM. This is the EC2 instance that um, kind of is serving my application. And you know, these uh, policies have found, hey, you uh, aren't using elastic block storage. That's kind of not great because then if the um, instance goes away, so does its data. Um, also, hey, you're not encrypting um, your data so that if somehow the machine were compromised or whatnot, um, that wouldn't be good. Um, similarly, you know, not having detailed monitoring. 
And so you can see how by just applying kind of uh, common policies, especially those that um, you know, are open source and can have um, a lot of uh, you know, developers with a lot of um, mindshare working on and raising that minbar or encoding best practices, how this can be uh, useful in just raising the, the bar for your own uh, cloud applications and infrastructure. So to recap, resource policy tools allow you to validate your resources and inspect um, you know, the actual state and not just the inputs. And this allows you to not only um, you know, prevent bad changes from happening, um, but also allows for uh, more complex interdependent resources. For example, if uh, you know, resource A's inputs depend on resource B's outputs, you actually couldn't test that using um, traditional uh, or, or using uh, the unit testing approach that uh, I went over earlier. So now we're onto the hardest part, systems testing, right? What do you do when uh, you want to test the full application, you know, run your end-to-end -end tests and, and actually use, you know, all the microservices and, and uh, bells and whistles of your environment? Well, if you're using infrastructure as code, this is actually kind of straightforward. You can just create an ephemeral environment. Um, that is, you know, you create the real cloud resources, you really stand them up, and then you can use the real application. And so these two images uh, on the right, you can see, one is just showing you the preview of changes that would be made when um, making an update. Right. So this is from the actual Pulumi service itself, and whenever and this particular um, uh, change was going to add a couple of metric alarms. Now that's kind of nice; it's good information. But you know, what would be even better is if, say, you used a tool like uh, Pulumify, which would then just stand up the Pulumi stack and then just point you to a, a URL that you could then test and interact with, and you know, actually see whatever um, changes or uh, features, you know, live on, on your cloud. And so this is a, a very powerful tool that allows you to have, uh, you know, a, a high fidelity view of the results of your changes. You can set up ephemeral environments using Pulumi, uh, uh, TerraTest, and kind of sort of any CI CD system if you configure it um, correctly. And so what would you need in order to step, uh, create an ephemeral environment? So when creating ephemeral environments, there's uh, a lot of trade-offs to make because every cloud application is a little different. Um, every team has different needs for the sorts of things that uh, they want to have um, easier to validate or um, you know, what's important to, uh, to look at. Right. So for example, if you're standing up a very sophisticated application, it may take a long time to create all those resources. And so maybe you'd only want to have your ephemeral environment stand up a subset of it so that it's you know, quicker to run and, and you know, validate. Um, you know, another trade-off could be say costs, right? If your uh, environment requires, you know, $30 uh, an hour to run because it needs a bunch of, you know, uh, high high um, demand resources, maybe that wouldn't be the greatest thing to, to stand up. So there are a lot of ways that you can um, kind of configure or tune your ephemeral environment to get it just right for something that works well for you, right? Ultimately, uh, ephemeral environments, you know, like policy as code, like unit testing of infrastructure, these are all techniques that you can apply towards gaining more confidence in your cloud applications and that you know, question is ultimately, well, how do you find the best set or, or way to apply these tools, you know, for your app? So when you're running or, uh, these cloud uh, or these ephemeral environments, um, you know, what, how do you want to get, you know, what do you do to get the most out of it, right? So first I would suggest kind of always looking at dependent services and components. Um, that's probably the most value you're gonna get out of that because it's usually the thing that will um, likely break. You know, similarly, um, deployment safety is a, another suggestion that I would highlight. 
not only is it beneficial to stand up an ephemeral environment and see what the change is, but there's also a, an implicit transition that takes place when you deploy those changes. And sometimes, if you're not careful, deploying those changes to your infrastructure could result in some downtime. It could be the case that when everything's all said and done, your app's working great. But where the, will there be a few seconds or maybe a few minutes in which your application isn't reachable or uh, just will fail all of its requests? You know, for example, there's sometimes where this unavoidable, like when you're uh, tr you know, switching between two uh, databases or um, you know, standing up new infrastructure. Um, but by using the ephemeral environment as a way to simulate these changes, you can then um, you know, run some sort of tool that will simulate load and then expect that it has you know, continual success while uh, the infrastructure transitions to its newer state. So let's look at how we can set up ephemeral environments in GitLab as an example. This was actually uh, straightforward to do. If we go to our GitLab CI, we can just create you know, our, our ephemeral environments um, uh, on merge requests and you know, wire through the um, merge request ID as that unique identifier. And so um, to do a, a little Julia Childs, uh, you know, put something in the oven, um, if we go to our production instance of our um, countdown as a service, you'll see this beautiful model that uh, we have for on, on the home page. But you can see that in Safari, it does not look all that great. Um, and it is because CSS is very hard, in case you did not know. And so if we go to our GitLab app, we can totally, we can click some totally random SAS file and Wow, if maybe we do need to uncomment this one line of code so that it'll render correctly. Um, you you kind of get where I'm, I'm going here. Well, I've already created a merge request to save us the time of creating the merge request and then waiting for the ephemeral environment to um, stand up and um, you know, get deployed. But you can see here's the pipeline um, and the uh, in the merge request, we also previewed the changes to um, production. And so within GitLab, because we're using um, a dynamic environment here, you know, there is a link to the uh, merge request version of this application or that ephemeral environment. And sure enough, by changing that CSS property, um, everything has been fixed, huzzah, right? The day is saved. So this all happened you know, automatically by, by configuring our GitLab uh, pipelines and just hooking it up with the right, you know, life cycle triggers so that it would create, stand up the ephemeral environment, um, which will then be visible in our merge request. But one thing that is kind of unfortunate is that although the pipeline ran and we previewed what the changes would happen in our production environment, um, you know, for example, it still has these policy warnings. You know, it's it's unfortunate that it isn't displayed in the merge request. Like, I don't know, if only there was a way to have Pulumi or whatever tool you're using to manage your infrastructure kind of surface that information on the merge request. Well, there's a, a session later today by a colleague of mine, Praneet Loki, and he'll be looking specifically at this problem and seeing what uh, you can do to kind of improve the experience from GitLab. But anyways, I'm gonna go ahead and merge this um, merge request into uh, you know, my repo. And then you can see a new pipeline has been started to um, you know, build, test the application. Um, but now you'll see that there's this new job for tearing down the ephemeral environment so that the environment that was created um, specifically for that merge request will be uh, destroyed, you know, the resources uh, reclaimed and so on. So, so far we've seen, uh, or we've seen how ephemeral environments can allow you to exercise your full application um, with all the bells and whistles um, so that you can better understand, you know, what changes are being made.
not just to your application code, but in the context of the in changes to the infrastructure that your application runs in as well. And overall, we've seen how we can apply uh, unit testing towards cloud infrastructure, applying resource policies towards cloud infrastructure, and then finally, these full ephemeral environments. And so to extend a perhaps in an uh, awkward metaphor, we'll, we'll see how, how well it fits. Um, some of you may be familiar with the video game Tetris, okay? And all of these tools and techniques, you know, that's all the, uh, the goo in the center there, right? Setting you up for success. And then finally, your continuous delivery pipeline is that wonderful, you know, four point vertical slice that's, you're gonna drop down into it and it all just, just works together and you will be able to move faster and have confidence that you're not breaking things. If you would like to learn more about, um, you know, infrastructure testing, um, you can uh, follow me on Twitter. And uh, by the time uh, of GitLab commit, there will be many more resources available on how to configure your GitLab pipelines. Um, and I'll be uh, tweeting about those extensively. Thank you very much and have a wonderful afternoon.